Well, welcome to our latest episode of Blind Pig, and um, we're going to be covering over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be covering a review of NFC East opponents, basically doing a rundown of uh, Dallas, the Giants, and Philadelphia offense, defense, special teams, and coaching. So uh, if you like tonight, uh, make sure you join us uh, over the next month as we cover all those teams. And of course, we, we're going to trash them uh, up and down as much as we can, but <laughs> just try to do a realistic view of, you know, what are we looking at? What are we facing in 2021? Um, but before uh, we get going, I just wanted to mention quickly that we lost a really great um, member of our forum community, which is bgobsession.com, um, for those of you that aren't members. And uh, her name was Sandy. She was known as Doc Sandy on the site. And uh, we went live in 2009, and Sandy was like our seventh or eighth uh, member to join She's been with us the entire time, been a really active member. And um, Sandy uh, grew up a Redskins fan back in the old school days. She's a little older than me, not much, though. And she and her husband, Bruce, were uh, season ticket holders during the Gibbs glory years. And Sandy owned one of the coolest pieces of Redskins swag that I think I've ever seen. I think I ever will see. And in fact, I proved her a couple of years ago about, hey, what's going <laughs> to what's going to happen to that thing eventually? But she and her husband actually grabbed the Redskins goalpost pad when RFK at RFK's last game, and it's sitting in her living room. So that's kind of a testament to Sandy. But Sandy's had a really tough year, um, been in and out of the hospital, although she did join us for our draft party, our yes, virtual draft party from the hospital. So that kind of tells you how intense she was. But she's just a wonderful lady. She's an animal lover. She was a Star Trek fan. I mean, like the, I'm going to a Star Trek convention. Uh, kind of Star Trek fan. Um, one of her personal friends was DeForest Kelly before he passed away. If you can imagine hanging out with DeForest Kelly, your buddy. Um, so she is just a wonderful person and we're going to miss her a lot. So I just, I didn't want to go let this pod go past without at least um, mentioning her and wishing good thoughts for her family and friends. She was delightful at a couple of tailgates where we got a chance to hang out and share a beer. We'll miss her. Godspeed, Sandy. One thing you would always notice about Sandy, she was a warrior. Uh, she would she would log into the game chat and be like, "Yeah, I fell last week and broke my leg, but I couldn't couldn't miss watching the game with you with you knuckleheads." And she always made made sure she was a part of the uh, the game. And chat. usually, usually she was the lone voice of positivity on in the darker <laughs> moments too. That's the other thing I loved about for a her. long I time. I certainly wasn't. Yep. So Sandy will definitely be missed. I personally never uh, got the opportunity to meet her. Uh, my only interaction with her was through the game day chats. And even in that setting, it was very evident and very easy to see that she was a person of character. She was always cordial, polite, uh, and positive in those game day chats. And, um, you know, it's a testament to the type of person that she probably was. Yeah, I didn't get to meet her either. And, and I, I, at this point, I actually count that a significant loss. Um, I, pretty much, I was going to say pretty much, Paul, I got to quit following you, man. You're like <laughs> way too good at this. So she always had a good word for, for everybody, um, which I find amazing because I struggle with that. She was just awesome. Yeah. Funny how an internet community can grow close. Right. Isn't it though? It, People it's a real, it's, it's for real. All right. So on to the NFC East, I guess. <laughs> Sorry to bring it on to a little lighter note here. But of course, I have a reaction. Instant reaction. Morgan Moses cut. Jerron Christian cut. Ryan Kerrigan not brought back. Signs with the Eagles for the, the change in Dan Snyder's recliner. How do you guys feel about those three moves? I've lost no sleep over any of them. I think we're seeing a real changing of the guard and the attitude and the approach to building a team. And we are making the kind of decisions that successful teams have been making for a very long time. You cut bait before it's too late and you bring in younger, cheaper players. It's a business. And I got nothing against any of those guys. Ryan Kerrigan's a warrior and a, probably a ring of famer and all that. But none of those moves trouble me from a football standpoint. So you put him in the ring of fame the minute he retires? 
Uh, I think I'd like him to come back and retire as a as a teamer and put his name up there. I don't know how they do the politics of the Ring of Fame, but I think his name belongs up there. I, I don't know how much of it is uh, how much of it is attitude, player attitude, and personality and character. I know you know more, Moses sometimes rubbed people the wrong way. He was uh, kind of out front with the whole Trent Williams thing. Um, I don't know if that came into play, but I, I really think even setting any of that stuff aside, I think they, he said, uh, Rivera said repeatedly, we're going young, we're going athletic, and we're going to, we're going to bring in guys that can, that can stay on the field that are tough. And not that Moses didn't stay on the field. He tried to, but um, he, he was pretty banged up the last couple of seasons. So I just think it's like Mark said, it's a changing of the guard and they're not afraid to mix, to, to mix it up and, and bring in some new faces. What do you got, Bob? Oh, I was just, you know, Kerrigan's the only one that I, that I, that I had second thoughts about. And the only reason I really had second thoughts about it is because of the, the character kind of guy he is. I, I'm not, you know, Moses take or leave, honestly. I mean, he did a pretty good job the first couple of years, but I, God, he's a yellow flag waiting to happen. And, you know, just every, you just, you just held your breath. Every single good play, you just waited, right? I don't, maybe I'm alone here, but I just kept waiting. We'd pick up 30 yards and I was waiting for the refs to flag Moses for holding somebody. Um, and I didn't understand the Christian pick when it happened. So, I mean, he would have been fine two rounds later, but not where they picked him. I so just I, threw him in there because he was a relatively early pick. Sure. We really haven't seen anything from him yet, but Moses yeah. and Kerrigan are the two biggies. You know, I, but I don't think Kerrigan was going to be worth the money it probably would have taken to keep him around was kind of the thing, right? You know, and I would have loved to, have, I would have loved to have seen him be a one team guy, but it wasn't a requirement. And I'm with Mark. I think he comes back, he signs a one day contract with the Skins to retire a Redskin, the all time sack leader, and, and he ends up with his name on the wall, and he should. I like that even if I disagreed with them getting moving on from Kerrigan, I love the fact that they did it knowing it was going to be unpopular and and not a fan uh, mm -hmm. favorite move. I love that they did it anyway uh, because that that to me is growth and we're, we're making adult decisions now, even if you don't agree with the decision. I will always forever, always and forever have a mental image of Ryan Kerrigan going wide around behind the quarterback. That's I was talking to an Eagles fan friend and he was, he was mentioning that. And I said, look, he'll get you 10 sacks, but he's going to probably have a couple plays a game that he runs himself out of rush defense. Oh, well, more than a couple. A, yeah. Yeah. A gaping hole. And you're going to look at that and say, what are you doing? So I mean, I'll miss him. I wish he would have stayed for what he signed for. I wish we would have kept him for that. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but I guess it came out Rivera and company reached out to him at the beginning of free agency and said, look, we're just not going to bring you back. It's over. And so be it. So that was the end of it. And I wish we would have been more competitive, but we went younger. We drafted two defensive ends. We've got Smith Williams who we drafted last year uh, and a couple more guys that we've got that we're showing out a little bit. So Chase Young takes that step, makes up for those miss Chase Young and, and sweat make up for those lost sacks. You got your young guys with some rotational pieces. I think we're going to be fine. It was just more of a feel good red skin story than anything else. Agreed. Yeah. Hell, I, for the record, yeah. For the record, I don't think we're giving up anything on the field by letting Kerrigan go. That wasn't, you know, I, he's past his prime by this point. So I'm fine with it from a, from a player move. All right. So I guess we'll now we'll talk about the worst team in the NFL <laughs> um, they're going to probably not win a single game this year and, and hopefully we get a repeat of our two matchups uh, John you mentioned you want me to kick off the offense first yeah let's start with the offense and what I thought we'd do because the, the coaching discussion even though we are going to have some coaching discussion isn't the most exciting uh, part of tonight so I thought what I would do is break it up and I'll, I'll open each of the units up with just a quick synopsis of who the coordinator is and we all kind of know who the coordinator is, but just a little bit about the coordinator. And some of you may know uh, more than I do um, about your area. So I'm going to start with um, offensive coordinator. And of course, when um, McCarthy came in, he brought, um, they elevated Jason Garrett's quarterback coach and former quarterback 
Kellen Moore. And Moore is actually um, has some promise to him. His first season, I don't know if you guys uh, honed in on this, but even though it was his first season as, as offensive coordinator, uh, McCarthy's first year in 2019, the, the um, Dallas offense hummed, or excuse me, Kellen Moore's first year as OC. Dallas was had the top overall NFL offense in the entire league. They averaged 435 yards a game, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, but in 2020, their numbers plummeted, and I think we all can uh, surmise why um, <clears throat> injury uh, to a key player. Um, they finished 14th overall in 2020 with an average of 371 yards per game, down from 435. Um, and in both of those seasons, though, Dallas has been a pass-dominant team, uh, throwing it twice as often as they rush it, and that's really not a surprise. Um, but the basic lesson of that is that the Dallas offense, no matter who the coordinator is, uh, they're a totally different beast with a healthy Dak Prescott and um, than they are without him. And um, that's going to be a big deal in 21 with him coming off a serious injury, as we know. Uh, and although Ezekiel Elliott can be a difference run making running back, and we've seen that in previous seasons early on, uh, it's going to be likely that they continue to underutilize him. And I'm specifically talking about more, Kellen Moore underutilizing him. His, his uh, rush attempts have dropped dramatically every single season. And last, last year was his career low. He only had 244 attempts and only got 979 yards on the ground in the entire season. So um, that's just something to watch as we watch Kellen Moore. But Kellen Moore, I mean, that first season as OC, uh, I mean, that was a dazzling de debut for an offensive coordinator. Uh, now, whether he can keep that up, if Dak Prescott isn't under center, I don't know. But the, the guy does have some, some talent as an OC. That's all I got on him. You so know, I'll dig a little deeper into the offense, or did you want to respond, Mark? <laughs> um, just before I lose the train, I just went to look up pre-DAC last year and, and after DAC went out. And this was more than I remember. The first six weeks of the season before, I guess, when he was playing, or five weeks, they opened with – they scored 17 against the Rams and lost. Then they scored 40 on Atlanta. They scored 31 on the Seahawks. They scored 38 on the Browns. They scored 37 on the Giants. Dak went out, and then they scored 10, 3, 9, 19, et cetera. So that was a prolific offense early in the season. They, they were losing games because they were scoring 38 and giving up 41. They basically picked right up in 2020, uh, right where they left off in 2019. Um, so, so let's go ahead and dive into the offense of, um, setting aside Mr. Moore. So looking at this offense last year, Mark, as you mentioned, the beginning of the season, they were dangerous. They were very dangerous, but injuries beyond just Dak are what caused them to go off the rails. They also lost their, their best three offensive linemen to extended periods and they ended up not finishing the season last year. Why they threw the ball twice as often as they ran the ball last year is completely beyond me, and it makes no sense. So, Kellen Moore, keep it up. Because mm -hmm. there was no reason with the likes of Ben DiNucci and Andy Dalton as your starting quarterback and Ezekiel Elliott in your backfield that you should lean on the passing game. But I think what put them into a tough spot was probably the fact that they were falling behind and falling behind quickly. So they had to try to get into a track meet, and they just fell apart. They couldn't lean on that running game, which is probably why Zeke had less than 1,000 yards last year. <clears throat> this season, for 2021, it all hinges on Dak and his two tackles. If his two tackles are healthy and Dak's healthy, that often, this offense can be dangerous, and it just got more dangerous as things are developing with the guys like CeeDee Lamb, Michael Gallup, I think they overpaid for Amari Cooper and Ezekiel Elliott, and I think they're going to start to feel that, to be honest with you. They're not going to be able to pay everybody. They're not going to be able to continue with that line going forward. They are not going. They have very little at tight end. In fact, didn't they just sign Jeremy Sprinkle to a one-year deal this offseason? So when you're running into situations like that, you're, they're not going to be able to continue to pay guys like Gallup and Lamb unless they make, you know, room elsewhere with Cooper. They just paid Dak. So I guess I would be lying if I told you I didn't want this offense 
because it's a good offense. I just don't like the logo on the side of the helmet. Uh, this year, you could argue I probably don't. I, I, it, we're a lot closer this year offensively. Washington is. Last year, we would have all given everything we could to have that offense. Absolutely. That line of players, that everything. We would have done it. And if anybody says that's no, that's wrong, it's just because they were the Cowboys. If you took that offense and put the, the Green Bay Packers logo on it, we would have traded it for everything we had. So it's going to be a dangerous offense depending on the health of Dak Prescott and his two offensive tackles. But I think they can be beat. And where I think they can be beat is that intermediate. If they don't use Zeke the way that Zeke made his hay in his early couple seasons out of the backfield, and they literally run him between the tackles like they've gotten had a tendency of doing, the offense becomes one-dimensional, and I don't think Dak's going to have the enough time to actually be effective because those weapons are going to want to go deep and they're going to want to go fast, and they're all going to want the ball. You can only throw one ball around. It's almost like a – They've got so much talent on the in, on the outside, the inside is going to start to worry me. So if you can get to Dak on this offense, if you can punish him, if you can prevent Elliott from beating you in the pass game, I think you can make them one-dimensional, which is what last year showed you. Uh, as John said, 2019, they averaged 430-plus yards a game. Last year, they averaged 370. But that number was probably well over 400 until Prescott went down. So depending on his ankle – depending on his protection, that's where it's all going to live and die with him. So one interesting thought I had as we were were talking, Derek, was, you know, this is the first time we're going to have all of the NFC East battles backloaded on the end of this schedule. So it's kind of a curious thing. Like you could argue that that's not a good thing for us because that gives Prescott a chance to get healthy and, you know, to get back to being Dak. But you could also argue he might not be under center. Uh, depending on what happens coming back from that injury. So I don't know how to spin that, but I think that's definitely going to be a big factor this year. Well, behind the old line that Dalton and Danucci had, I don't know that Dak is as effective. Um, a lot of people look at Prescott as the linchpin, but I look at that old line and that's my biggest question mark because where – yeah, Prescott, he's going to get older. He's now had a serious leg injury. He made some plays moving quite a bit early in his career, and I I don't think that's going to stop. Well, I don't think he can not do that and still be as effective. He's going to need that bullet in his chamber, or he's going to need four to five – you know, he's going to need enough time behind the pocket. So that O-line, it all starts up front, and I know that's a cliche, but – I, I don't and, think they can get it done without that O-line. It, and it, it's not a, a cliche in this case. The man's coming back from, from a bum wheel. He is not going to be as mobile in the pocket or out of the pocket. He's going to need to move. If, uh, if you're a defensive coordinator, you want to put pressure right in his face and get him off his platform and see if he can move and make plays. Who's behind? Is it still just Tony, Tony Pollard behind Elliott, Derek? Do we know? Is there anyone else? Oh, I just had their roster up in front of me, but the window was white. You know, I'm so looking at last year, and, and yeah. Zeke had 244 carries. Pollard had 101, and then no other running back really is on the radar. Tony Pollard, Rico Dodel? Rico yeah. Dodel, who had seven carries last year. Did they draft any running backs? No. 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 So no. they need to keep Zeke upright. Yeah, so they're so top-heavy that – one injury and that whole offense comes off the rails. And talk about that. You were, you were talking about the line, Derek. One of the things while I was researching the defensive players, one of the things that kept coming up while I was while I was reading stuff about Micah Parsons, their top pick, was there are a lot of people down here irritated that the Cowboys took a linebacker one when Slater was on the board. Tyron Smith has kind of become their version of, of Trent Williams, right? He's great when he's healthy, but he hasn't played a full season since 2015. He misses games every single year, and there really isn't a legit backup in there behind him. They've got the same problem with uh, uh, Lyle, Lyle? How they Lyle Collins. Yeah. yeah, Collins on the other side. Collins hasn't been completely healthy either. It, Everybody down here is like, man, you know, they're so stupidly thin at tackle. They couldn't believe that they took a linebacker. Granted, the defense was historically bad last year. 
And, and I think you can make a, a real argument for what they did. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but not taking a tackle in this, in this draft just seems almost criminal considering the, the circumstances that they've been in the last couple of years on that line. You know, what was it, two years or just two years ago, they had the best offensive line in football? And not by a little bit either. I mean, they were just bulldozing people. And that's – you kind of wonder what their game plan was because they've invested so much on the offensive side of the ball. The, the defense was barren. That, I mean, Micah Parsons is a stud. You know, they got Jabril Cox, who I liked. They got a couple more guys – and by the way, they drafted Simi Fajoko out of Stanford, which kind of pissed me off. I'm <laughs> very happy about that. But um, their defense isn't going to be ready to keep up with their offense. You almost have to wonder why, if you're going to do that, you go all in on offense and you just score 50 points a game. You know what I mean? Like, because they might score 35, but I don't see their defense shutting down the, the every offense that they're going to face now. I mean – well, even and where the, I'm sorry, where yeah. they chose to invest too. that what I'm looking at it from the outside in, if, if I'm a Dallas fan right now, I'm thinking I've got a team that's building from the outside in and ignoring the inside. Mm. We know a team that did that for a generation. Yeah, we do. Our lines couldn't, it didn't matter who we had outside, who we had at linebacker, who we had at corner. We couldn't stop anybody at the line of scrimmage and we couldn't block anybody. Yeah, and we're, um, we're, we're, drafting people like um LaRon Landry and and you know, ignoring outside them. linebacker Brian Arakpo and these stud outside defensive men without the meat and potatoes. As you were talking about them not drafting a, uh, an off offensive lineman this year. They didn't draft defensive linemen high either. And when when I review their defensive line later, I'm going to run a bunch of names by you who are first and second on their game on their uh, depth chart. And you ain't never heard before. That, that is not a strong team up front. So they better hope that they're good on the outside and that Dak is quick on his feet and that Zeke is more interested in playing football than, than cashing checks at this point because they're going to need to score points. So, so <laughs> offense is complete. So let's uh, we all think that their offense is going to be – has the ability to be potent, but it's kind of I need to see it before I believe it kind of situation, right? And they're thin at key positions. I mean, when you're thin at quarterback and running back, that's a kind of a scary thing. And tackle. The, the, and isn't, tackle. Isn't the key for them is going to be Dak, right? He's the straw that stirs the drink. We saw it last year. If he's not right and he can't stay on the field, they're going to have a lot of problems on offense. All right. So next, do you want to jump? We can jump straight into the defense. John, did you want to jump on the uh, DC? And then we can let, let Mark and uh, – Mark and Bob run away with it a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I'm only mentioning this because I enjoy it um, personally. But you know, when um, when McCarthy came to town, he brought Mr. Vanilla with him, uh, <laughs> Mr. Vanilla Ice Cream, Mike Nolan. So that told you right out of the gate that this guy's a coaching genius um, because we know all about Mike Nolan. Nothing against Mr. Nolan. Uh, I'm sure he's a fine human, but um, it was kind of a Joe Barry hire. I mean, I just screamed Joe Barry when I heard that. I'm like, oh my god, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I don't get it, but um, the Dallas D predictably finished 23rd in yards given up that first year and 28th in points allowed. Um, and that led to, voila, Mike Nolan looking for another job again, uh, again, Joe Barry. But the new D.C., uh, they made a major upgrade because they, they got Dan Quinn. And if you're not super familiar with Dan Quinn, Dan Quinn should make us a little bit nervous. Not a lot, but a little bit because – He's the guy that had that that put that Seattle defense together that dominated for two years at the top of the NFL uh, before he got his coaching stint in Atlanta, his head coaching stint. So basically, he went to Seattle, cranked out the top defense in the league, two years of running, and then he got he got uh, you know stolen uh, for Atlanta's head coaching job. His defenses over a six-year head coaching tenure in Atlanta have been consistently bottom half of the league. And I don't know, I don't know how much, of, how much input he has into the, into the defense there in Atlanta, but um, it's, so it's kind of a question of which is the real Dan Quinn, the guy who had mediocre to subpar defenses in Atlanta as a head coach for six years. Maybe that was on the DC. I don't know. Or the guy that was so impressive in a two year stint in Seattle that he got, they got him a head coaching gig. 
So I don't know the answer to that, but I tend to lean more towards um, he's a pretty good defensive coordinator. Um, and I, I think he did have great personnel in Seattle, but I, I, I just, I just, he just seems like one of those coaches that has the it factor and can get a, de a defense um, really going. So I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a reluctant believer in Dan Quinn. I think um, of the guys on the coaching staff, he's pretty solid. Can I, can I talk about Dan Quinn a little bit? I didn't know much about him. So I went and did a little research. Those two years in Seattle have, have earned him the right to be a head coach for a while and gotten him another job. But listen to this, Dan Quinn has been a, a defensive coach for 27 years, starting in 1994. He had seven years at small colleges as a DL coach. He had one year as a co-defensive coordinator, D-line coordinator at Hofstra in 2000. He got hired by San Francisco, did two years by the, with the 49ers. 2001, 2002, he was a defensive quality control coach. And then he did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years as the defensive line coach in San Fran, Miami, the Jets, and Seattle. He went back to college for two more years. So far, he's been defensive coordinator one year through all of this. He went back for two years at Florida and was a D coordinator, D line coach. That got him the job in Seattle. When he showed up in Seattle as a first time defensive coordinator in the NFL, he turned out the 2000 and two, the 2013 and 14 Seattle defenses that won a Super Bowl and would have won another one if they had given the ball to the big guy and not tried to throw it at the goal line. So that earned him the right to go become a head coach. Uh, he's been a head coach for six years in Seattle. One of those years, 2019, he was head coach and D coordinator. And as, like John said, his, his defense was middle of the pack. So I don't know what the hell we're looking at with Dan Quinn. Is he the guy who architected those two amazing defenses or is he a guy who's bounced around the league as a DL coach kind of looking for the right job um, and who stood there and watched Tom Brady pick apart his defense in the biggest comeback in Super Bowl history uh, when Dan Quinn was looking for a place to hide. I don't know what Dan Quinn is. They, he, they better hope down there that he's the 2013 and 14 guy. Yeah, I think that's a fair, that's a fair summary. I, uh, I don't know. That 13-14 defense in Seattle was one of the most talented defenses. I mean, Bingo. you know, just in, in terms of, of, of guys, right, in terms of raw talent walking out there on the field. And I think, quite frankly, maybe a little bit of brains, right? Not just, not just speed and, and, and power, but they were thinkers uh, at the same time. They really knew where they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to do and, and could execute on anything and everything. I, the only defense I've ever seen that comes that that's in, that is in that same breath as the the Baltimore defense from the Ravens heydays, and two thousand. Yeah, I mean they had a line that. I, all right, it, it burns me to say this. Richard Sherman's a really good cornerback, but you know what? When you're getting pressure on the quarterback in two and a half seconds my grandmother can play cornerback. <laughs> you know, all you've got to do is, is be a speed bump to that receiver. Just slow and him watch the backfield. Bit. That's all he had to do. And that and watch the backfield. That's right. Wait you know, the jam the guy out. for a split second, make sure the ball carrier is not coming around the corner. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it was, it was so talented. I'm not sure that one of us couldn't have coached it. So if I can just throw something out there, I, you got me thinking, Mark, Pete Carroll, was a defensive coordinator before he take over as the head coach mm -hmm. of the Seattle Seahawks. So how much of that, not to poke holes in here, uh, John, how much of that was Dan Quinn and how much of that was Pete Carroll? No, I, and I, guys, don't get me wrong. I, I'm right there with you. You want the holes poked? <laughs> it's which, which um, sample do you want to look at? And right. I mean, to Mark's point, the sample size of him not being anything special is a lot larger than the two years of glory in Seattle. So I, I'm not, I'm not sold on him. I just think he's competent. And all we know for sure is that if you give him a lot of talent, he know he'll get out of the way and let and and they'll have a good defense. That's what I think. I'm I'm busily trying to look up what the Seattle defense looked like the year before he got there. 
So carry <laughs> on and I'll find that. Well, I, I wonder about him and I wonder that like to, to Bob's point, that team was stacked. And that, that was something to this day I will always say is that Richard Sherman was never as good as his height. And it's the same argument I have for Josh Norman. Josh Norman was perfect for the same exact role Richard Sherman excelled in. Monday Night Football would always say, oh, Josh Norman's following the number one or Richard Sherman's man-to-man against, you know, Des Bryant. Or, no, those guys were very, very good at playing zone defense press corner they were very reactive they knew how to play the ball but they were not island type like daryl green like Deion sanders like darrell revis so that those defenses were set up for the cornerbacks to feast it was that way in carolina with norman and it was that way in seattle with sherman well here you go in 2012 the year before dan quinn got there the Seattle defense was number one in points allowed, number four in yards allowed. This was a good defense he took over. Yeah. So let's talk personnel on the Dallas um, defensive side of the ball. What do, what do they got that we need to be concerned about? You want to go back to front, Bob? We can go back to front if you want to. Um, <clears throat> just look. All right. So, well, let's back up for a quick second. So in the off season, Dallas obviously recognized they've got a problem. Here's some, some interesting things that have happened this year. Five new free agent additions. The first six picks in the draft for the Cowboys were defense. Eight out of 11 picks were defense. Here's where it gets fun. Under Jerry Jones, the previous high for defensive picks in the draft, four guys. And that was 1994. They have never picked more than four defensive players in a single draft before this. Hmm. Gee, sound familiar? I mean, oh my gosh, I begin to, you, you really begin to see, see the similarities. Um, so if we, you know, we start with the backfield. They gave up 473 points last year. That's a franchise record for a season. They gave up over 62,000 yards or 6,200 yards in the, as a defense. Might as well have been 62,000. Yeah. May as well have been 62,000. Right. <laughs> yeah. They gave up over 6,200 yards as a defense. Um, and a lot of that was a significant amount of that was through the air. Uh, they only had 13 picks on the year. This was just most of the websites that I found showing a depth chart. They played three safeties so much that the depth charts aren't showing three linebackers. They're showing three safeties and two linebackers or two safeties, a linebacker and a quote designated pass rusher on top of the three or four linemen is what I was, is what I found almost everywhere I went to look. Um, So they seem pretty happy with the, with the safeties because they didn't draft a safety and it doesn't look like they brought one in in free agency. The starting safeties last year, uh, Wilson and, and Casey, were two and three on the team in tackles. They re-signed Casey. He was a free agent. They re-signed him. Oh, was he? I wonder if they're counting him as one of the free agents. I didn't actually go look that up. But as I far if- as I can tell, Bob, they brought in one safety, um, Keanu Neal. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, they- he's depth. He's not... Yeah, he didn't show. Correct. He was he was a five year guy with Dan Quinn in in Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah, yeah. You know, here, here's another one of those fun things. A safety was number four on their list of sack leaders behind three defensive ends. To get to a linebacker, you've got to go all the way to tenth. Yeah, on the sack list, but a linebacker was their lead tackler for the year. But anyway, so they drafted three corners. Kelvin Joseph was the was the number two was the number two draft pick, um, and and I think you're I think you're looking at Quinn setting up to play something similar to what they played in what he played in Seattle. Uh, Joseph's he's not a big guy he's six feet one ninety seven but he's a bit of a brawler. He's a very physical cornerback. He has absolutely no qualms about getting up in somebody's face and jamming them at the line of scrimmage. He can't he loved that kind of stuff in college. Uh, and for you guys that were watching tape on our top draft pick. 
you probably saw Joseph in some of those clips because he, because he was on that same Kentucky defense. Um, but again, like Dallas does, he's he's got maturity issues. There have been knocks on him for years about discipline issues on and off the field. He's been suspended for games. Um, you know, so I, I'm not sure whether or not they have actually improved that secondary much at all. Uh, the other two guys appear to be projects, Nashon Wright and uh, Israel uh, Muka Uma. Ooh, I can't, I'm not going to get that right. So I'm just going to leave it there. You know, they're, they're <laughs> definitely, they're definitely going to be, they're definitely going to be project type guys. I mean, um, Wright, I, everywhere I read about him, he's like, if Wright doesn't keep the receiver in front of him, Wright's giving up a touchdown because he's not catching anybody from behind. It's never going to happen. Once the guy's got a step on him, once NFL talent has a step on him, they're gone. So uh, the, the backfield, eh, defensive backfield, eh, I don't know whether, I don't know how much they've, they've actually upgraded themselves. Linebacker Micah Parsons is a big upgrade. And I can tell you that all the, all the sportscasters down here are, are lo loving what bits and pieces they're seeing out of the mini camps, that the, the OTAs that they're running. They have played him at all three linebacker positions. They have also had him practicing at defensive end opposite Lawrence. Please keep that up. <laughs> well, the point is he's playing well everywhere he plays. Yeah, you okay, know, that's I, fine. Good and at, I don't, good at, good at, good at all, but master of none, that's fine with me. I waste that talent. Well, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think it's going to be very interesting to see. I think he's probably going to play in the middle more than he plays anywhere else. Um, although I think they will probably move him to the end for obvious passing downs opposite Lawrence periodically. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how well Parsons survives in that middle linebacker spot with the lack of talent in front of him. Because we all know that that middle linebacker is only as good as the defensive tackles that are that are keeping the offensive linemen off of him. And Mark's going to talk about those guys here in a minute. And I have an idea what he's going to say. Uh, and I think I think Parsons is in for a real learning experience this year because the Cowboys really just didn't do him any favors uh, on that line very much. Jabril Cox um, was the was the weak side linebacker last year. He was their top tackler. And when I say their top tackler, I mean he better than doubled up the number two guy on the team. He had he had uh, over 150 total tackles. The next guy on the on the list had 72. Uh, so Cox is kind of a, a, a real cog in the in the machine. And then the other linebacker, which did he on and off the field last year, he only played 10 games, Light and Vander Esch. And, and, but when he played, he played well. Yeah, it's like all going to come down to what the defensive line does, I think, in all honesty. I mean, I, I think they, they may have a fairly solid linebacking crew, but the linebackers are only as good as, as the blocks that they don't pick up. And I think, I think teams are going to eat the defensive line alive, but Mark may say different. Before I say anything, Paul. Yeah, Paul, I see you <laughs> what, shaking your head pretty good. What there, are you buddy. thinking, brother? Well, I'm just thinking about Parsons and I mean, Bob, you've already alluded to it, but I mean, Dallas is really good with the hype train. Uh, the media does a really good job of selling hype when it comes to the Cowboys. Since when? <laughs> since, <laughs> since forever. I mean, we, we've been in this scenario before as well, where we've brought in some, you know, highly touted linebackers in the past and they come in here and they do absolutely nothing. Um, my question is, and again, Bob was alluding to it, is a guy like Parsons, who I think they're really hanging their hat on to change that defense, is he going to be insulated well enough to make a defense that was in essentially a bottom feeder last year even become average in 21? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, so I've, let me, we'll take two, one step back. What, what they're dealing with down there is coming off the, probably the worst defense in, in God knows how many years that they've ever put on the field. They've rebuilt everything. They have new coaching. They have a mess of new players and they're counting on some young guys. There is going to be a steep learning curve on the field for this defense, particularly because their schedule looks like ours. They're playing a lot of really good teams. They're not getting any breaks. Um, I think Micah Parsons in two years might easily be a perennial Pro Bowl player. I think he's got that kind of talent. The question to me is going to be how quickly 
he can do that on week one. Is he ready to be an impact player? Probably not. He's going to be trying to looking at his wrists and trying to figure out where he's supposed to be. Remember LeVar Arrington, his first year who was running around a lot, but he was never where he was supposed to be. Um, mm. If, if I can tie that into the defensive line, we have seen in this town over the last two years, what can happen when you finally stop drafting linebackers and cornerbacks and bringing in outside guys on both sides of the ball and you focus on building a core. We had one of the best defenses in the league last year with a very average linebacking core. We have had good linebackers before without a line. And like Bob was just saying, they didn't do a damn thing for us. And we were a bottom feeder. So I was looking at the depth chart for the defensive line because I'm, I'm kind of sensitive to that nowadays. I'm, I'm proud of ours. And I was wondering what theirs looks like. Demarcus Lawrence is a stud. Nothing bad to say about the man. He's the left defensive and he's going into his eighth year. He's got 45 and a half sacks when he's right. And if he had someone on the other side to take away pressure from him, he's an impact player. Nothing bad to say about him. I wish, I wish he was on our team. Next up, next to him is Neville Gallimore at left defensive tackle. He's a second year player. He played last year. He's a third round pick out of Oklahoma, had a half a sack. He was out there. I don't think he was an impact player. He is the projected starter at left defensive tackle. At right defensive tackle, we've got Tristan Hill, who is a two-year player. He was a second round pick in 2019. He played in 12 games over the last two years. He has 10 tackles. He has zero sacks. He is not an impact player in the middle. Next to him on the outside might be Randy Gregory, if he is still walking the streets and not back in on suspension or in a program. He's a three-year player. If he ever gets right, he'll be good. He played 10 games last year, had three and a half sacks and was sort of an impact player, but you just don't know what you're going to get with him. There's not a whole lot of, of you can't count on the guy uh, from week to week. He's not a big guy. He's, he's tall, but he's only, he's six, five and two forty. He's kind of an athletic freak. Um, is he an anchor on the outside against the run? I've never seen that in him. Uh, they need to hope that Randy Gregory is a good complement to DeMarcus on the other side. I'll quickly go down the, the, the twos. Left defensive end two is Doreen Armstrong. 6'4", 260, three-year player. He was a fourth round pick out of Kansas. He has started all but two games in his first three years. Credit to him there. Uh, two and a half sacks. Uh, if he was likely to explode and blow up and be a better player, I don't think he'd be, uh, well, he'd be pushing for more playing time. They better hope that he develops into a solid backup for Lawrence. Left defensive tackle two is Osa Idigizua, who is a rookie that they drafted this year out of UCLA in the third round. Right defensive tackle, too, is Carlos Watkins, was a fourth-round pick in 2017 out of Clemson. He played four years with Houston. Houston let him walk. He is now in Dallas, and they're hoping that he'll be a helpful player. He has four sacks in four years, not an impact player. And at right defensive end, backing up uh, Mr. Gregory, and this guy's going to see some playing time, is Chauncey Golston, a six foot five, 275 a 70 pound rookie out of Iowa that they have drafted. And there are some names behind those guys, but you haven't heard of them either. There are rookies like and like the corn fed white guy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm just John C. Golson. There's <laughs> so new that there's not a picture of him on NFL.com yet. We need to, we need to check on that. So yeah. all of that was to make the point that the defensive line best case scenario has a couple of good outside guys and really nothing in the middle and nobody coming in behind to push. There's not a depth of rotation there. They're going to have a tar hard time putting uh, pressure on the passer. And I think they're going to have a hard time stopping the run unless Micah Parsons is a baller. So there you go. That's what I think about their defensive line. I, I think they're in trouble on that side of the ball based on that. I, well, we all know it takes more than one year to rebuild any unit. Um, so I think that's kind of where they're at. I think they re obviously they recognize, as Bob was saying, with the, the focus on the defense, they've recognized they have problems, but I don't think you can fix it in one year. No, and they didn't fix it by drafting big guys. No, 
no they and and they're taking a lot of heat for that too locally by the way um you, you know the i'm not even going to try and pronounce his name you obviously worked on it mark you no, I just said it like I meant it and figured nobody would bust me. <laughs> well, it worked. It worked. But yeah, but but you know, he's not a what they really need from everything I read down here and from everything I hear from the, you know, the local the local sports guys is is a nose. You know, somebody that's just going to get right up over te- over that center and and own the middle of that line and let his other DT partner, you know, work on whichever guard is left over. And a, somebody that's going to demand two guys and own two guys. And Osa is not that guy. Uh, and everybody says he's not that guy. So the, the, the line really didn't get any better this year. It's Lawrence and a bunch of guys is really what it is. Osa is 6'2", 280. He's not a 330-pound, you know, Mm-mm. man in the Baby. middle. And, and he's a rookie. He's a rookie, no. right? And, Even and the best rookies... At 6'2", 280, Chase Rollier is going to blow him off the ball. Mm-hmm. And Scherf is going to come looking for him. You know, they'll, they'll put two guys on him and say, let's see what Micah Parsons is all about. I hate to admit this, but Cha- Chauncey Golston was, was one of those. I almost talked about him in our late round flyer draft pod. I don't know that I would have spent a third on him, but I think he's more talented than people are giving him credit for. Um, I just hope we don't see it for about five years. Mm-hmm. Again, everything that we've talked about, they think about the, there's a whole new strange brew they're cooking up down there. Coaching, players, the system, they're going from 3-4 to 4-3. They're not, it's going to take them a while. The The good news for them, I guess, if it's good news and, and potential bad news for us is we don't get them until the very end of the year. So whatever Quinn has, he will have had a chance to, to put it together and cook it a while. Uh, we'll find out what they're all about in, in December. All right. Well, there was not nearly enough negativity about this football team. So, John, <laughs> no, if you can please talk about Mike McCarthy Mark, for a couple minutes. Did you say anything positive about the defense? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all question marks. I we did. I like I like Demarcus Lawrence. I think the man yeah. is a stud. Uh, I is. would I would take him in a second. But, and I think if Gregory can stay out of jail and on the field, um, the the one thing he's credited with saying so far is how proud he is of himself because he hasn't gotten in trouble in the last year or so. And we we've still got to talk about special teams, right? That too. Uh, but they just paid Lawrence a boatload of money. They did. So again, he needs to produce. They're very top heavy. Again, they've had a very big contract for somebody that is considered an elite level player. But at some point, you got to squeeze the balloon on one side. It's going to get bigger. You know, it, you're going to run out of room pretty quickly. Uh, uh, but, you know, we've been saying that about the Cowboys for 20 years now about how they don't handle a salary cap well. They, don't, they never have a fire sale. They always they don't to win. on to most of the guys they want to hang on to. Yeah, they, they haven't won in those 20 years. <laughs> no, they haven't. No, no, they haven't. But but the point remains that the, I don't think the reason they haven't won is because they can't handle the salary cap. I think the reason they haven't won is because Jerry Jones isn't the general manager. That's well, that's, it's all together. It all comes together. When you're paying – when you're paying uh, Amari Cooper, the money you're paying Amari Cooper, and then you, you draft CeeDee Lamb – when you've got Gallup on the field and now you've got three stud wide receivers, but you're, you have very little at tight end. You have no depth on your O-line and you have the worst defense in the NFL. Wait, wait, wait. Jason Witten came out of retirement to, to play last. What do you mean? Nothing at tight end. (laughs) Jeremy Sprinkle. But then (laughs) you guys are talking about how bad their defense was. And they used a first round pick on CD lamb last year. Mm-hmm. They're ignoring yeah. the lines, guys. They're ignoring the lines. So I'm while 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 Paul talks about the special teams, and if John has a tidbit on the special teams coordinator, I'm going to lose it. Um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at who was actually on the board when they took CD Lamb, and we can see how they might have actually looked different. So go ahead, there, Paul or John or. Well, you hurt my feelings, so I'm going to let Paul take take it away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I'm, I'm going to confess to you guys, I'm going to have to go take a really, really good shower when this is all done, because I'm, I'm going to have a lot of good things to say, unfortunately, about their special teams and 
that doesn't sit well with me to talk nicely about the Dallas Cowboys. Um, we, we know that there's a lot of hype for them coming into the year. You know, obviously they got Prescott returning. They're excited about some of those linebackers that they brought in on defense via the draft. They're excited about Dan Quinn. You know, we've already mentioned it. Uh, Dallas gets hyped up a lot. They usually don't live up to that hype. Um, but probably one aspect of their team that has a legitimate reason to be hyped out, up about is the special teams group. Um, I'm personally pretty confident in saying that their special teams will be one of the strengths of their team in 2021 and something that they can really hang their hat on. And potentially this unit can be one that can steal a few games for them. So at a glance, who's who for Dallas on special teams? Uh, John Fossil is their special teams coach. He's highly regarded around the league. Um, they got Greg Zerline uh, as kicker. Uh, there's going to be a uh, competition between Hunter Niswander and Brian Anger uh, at the punter position. Uh, Anger is a 10-year uh, vet in this league. He was a third-round draft pick as a punter, I believe the highest ever uh, drafted punter in, in the NFL. They got Tony Pollard as kick returner, C.D. Lamb potentially as their punt returner, and they got a really good special teams ace uh, by the name of C.J. Goodwin, who they're really high on and who they uh, re-signed. Uh, this past off season. So from 2013, just a little bit of uh, history here. Uh, from 2013 to 2017, the Cowboys had three top 10 finishes in the NFL in overall special teams rankings. In that five year span as well, uh, their team never ranked any lower than 13th overall in the league as a special teams unit. It was no coincidence that over that five year span, they finished 500 or better four out of those five years. So there's something to be said about the value of special teams and the overall impact that it can have on team performance. Uh, we fast forward a bit to 2019, they bottomed out completely in special teams. They finished 27th overall. And that was what basically ignited, uh, you know, the spark for the change to bring in John Fossil um, to rectify their special teams issues coming into 2020. Um, so I said earlier that special teams is a strength for this team, something that they're going to be able to hang their hat on. There's probably people out there who think that I'm absolutely out of my mind for saying that because a lot of their special teams headlines from a year ago were headlines for the wrong reasons. Uh, their special teams play directly contributed to many early season losses. The first game of the year, Greg Zerline misses a field goal. They lose 20 to 17. Uh, the following week against Seattle, they had two extra point misses. Uh, Tony Pollard made a, made a horrible decision returning the ball out of the end zone on a kickoff. He ended up fumbling on that play. Dallas recovered on their one yard line. On the very next play, Seattle got a safety. So those four so missed points, <laughs> those four missed points that Dallas left off the board forced them at the end of the game to go for a game winning touchdown as opposed to potentially a game winning field goal. Uh, that Atlanta game last year was really popular as well. Uh, we all know that they came back in that game and ended up winning, but they were down 14 nothing early in the first quarter. They went for a fake punt from their own 29-yard line, which uh, they failed on. They tried another fake punt in the fourth quarter of that same game and missed. Um, and we all know about the Thanksgiving game against Washington. Uh, we're up 20-16 to 16 with 12 minutes left in the fourth quarter. Dallas fakes a punt on fourth and 10 from their own 24. And the I wheels know. fell off for them from there. Can we, can we relive your talking special teams? The bungle of the Falcons on that onside kick. Oh, I'm getting to that. <laughs> okay, when we were talking Falcon, that was the worst onside kick recovery I've ever seen in my entire life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I mentioned that people would think I'm out of my mind for saying that their special teams is going to be a good unit. But if you dig a bit deeper beyond what I just talked about, uh, and if you don't just look on the surface of things, the fact is that they steadily improved as a unit uh, over the course of the year. And I think that that's a testament to John Fossil and the work that he did. Uh, they started covering kicks better. Uh, they ranked ninth with only 20.9 uh, yards per kick return uh, given up against. Uh, they started returning kicks better as well. They ranked third overall with 26.1 yards per kick return average. Uh, in the second half of the year, they had to replace their punter. Hunter Niswander came in, who I believe was on their practice squad, and he ended up ranking eighth overall with 47.2 uh, yards per punt over the last eight games of the season. 
The return game picked up as the season progressed as well. C.D. Lamb ranked 11th in the the league in punt returns. Tony Pollard, despite some bad decisions early in the year in terms of his returns, he ended up ranked fourth overall in total uh, kick return yards league-wide with 766. They had their fair share of big moments on special teams as well throughout the year. Uh, as, As we were just saying, there was that infamous onside kick against Atlanta that they somehow recovered for the win. I suppose we can ignore the fact that there were literally three Falcons players who watched the ball roll by them and invited the Cowboys to recover. Um, They had four games where they had a kickoff return that went for more than 60 yards. I found that pretty impressive. Five games during the year where they averaged more than 30 yards uh, per per kickoff return. Um, They had one kickoff return for a touchdown uh, on the season against the 49ers. Granted, it was on an onside kick attempt. Uh, Greg Zerline had some pretty good stats throughout the year as well. He made three or more field goals seven times in a game. uh, And on two occasions, he made four field goals in a game. There were eight occasions on the season where their kicking game contributed 10 or more points. I know that they struggled scoring points as the season went on, uh, but there were eight instances where they scored 10 or more points just through special teams. By comparison, Washington did it three times. Uh, All in all, they finished seventh overall in special teams. They were in the top 15 in all uh, major special teams categories as well throughout the year. Um, So this was a really a unit that really, really came together, um, especially in the second half of the year. And they added uh, many impact plays uh, on Sundays. One thing that we have to keep in mind with Dallas, especially under John Fossil, you have to remember on special teams, expect the unexpected from these guys. They're going to keep you on your toes on special teams. I've mentioned the fake punt attempts. Uh, We saw one against Washington. They had uh, two fake punt attempts against Atlanta. They also had a ridiculous uh, punt return uh, where they lateraled and literally threw the ball across the field to CJ Goodwin. Uh, against the Steelers. He returned at 73 yards. And if you watch that play closely on the play, when Goodwin's getting in position to receive the pass on the far end of the field, he's faking a leg injury. So as to like completely put himself out of the play, he ended up returning at 73 yards. Now that's great coaching. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Trickeration is definitely the name of the game with this unit. And teams are going to have to be on high alert with their, uh, in regards to it with John Fossil as coach. So where's their weakness? If I had to nitpick on special teams and find a weakness, I would say it's their long field goal attempts. Uh, Zerline's really, really consistent under 50 yards. He's, he's a veteran in this league. Uh, he went 31 for 32 under 50 uh, yards last year. But when asked to kick uh, or when asked to make attempts beyond 50 yards, he was only three of nine. Um, now in the three previous seasons prior to that, he was 15 of 20 beyond 50 yards. So obviously the ability is there. You have to wonder if last year was just an aberration for this guy, or if it's the start of a trend. I hope it's the start of a trend for him. Uh, in summary, special team success, in my opinion, is often predicated by consistency. Dallas is going to have a lot of consistency coming back, uh, in 2021, on their special teams unit. Fossil is going to be staying on as special teams coach. Uh, they're going to have a proper off season to scheme and get better under his tutelage. Zerline is going to be staying on as kicker after a solid year. Um, there's going to be a battle at, at, uh, at punter. Um, Niswander and Anger are going to be fighting it out. Um, but again, even if Nis, even if, sorry, even if Anger, uh, supplants Niswander he's a guy who's averaged over 46 yards per punt over the course of his career so he's a guy with some ability um if they want to use cd lamb at punt returner you know uh he's still obviously an option there i don't know if they want to risk you know possible injury with putting him back there but he's obviously going to be coming back and can be someone who's an option to continue uh fulfilling that role and tony pollard's going to be back as kick returner where he finished fourth overall in total kick returns. Um, They re-signed CJ Goodwin, who was awesome for them on special teams. Uh, He played in 71% of their special team snaps a year ago. 
their one significant change on special teams is much like us. Uh, they're parting with a with, with a long time long snapper LP Latasur. Uh, they've opted to go with a guy from the Rams, Jake McQuaid, who is a former two time Pro Bowler and has um, and has familiarity with John Fossil as he was previously with them uh, with the Rams. So there's certainly a lot of continuity uh, returning back for Dallas in 21 on their special teams unit. Is there anybody in the draft that can potentially help them on special teams? Absolutely. Uh, we know that the draft class could often be the lifeblood of a strong special teams unit, and it can certainly help a team establish consistency with their special teams as years progress. There's one particular name that can certainly make an impact on their special teams unit, and that's uh, Simi Fahoko, who we already brought up a bit earlier. He's a speed threat. He can certainly act as a core special teamer early on in his career for Dallas with his good size. Um, and he certainly has to, he has the ability to make a strong special teams unit even stronger in 21. So I personally feel all in all that this team has to feel good about where they're at when it comes to their special teams. And, you know, does it make the difference in making the playoffs or not making the playoffs? Potentially. I mean, I think their offense and defense are going to have a, a greater role in that regard, but um, they certainly have a lot to look forward to uh, on the special team side. Well, I'm glad you said nice things about um, Fossil because a he's I think he's been a I think he's been a special teams coordinator for something like 17 years, and he also lost his dad uh, Jim Fossil this week. If you didn't if you didn't read that on social media, so yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, so I thought what we would do to close out. It's a good report, Paul. Sorry. That's a good report. And they're going to need to be able to kick field goals. I think, I think having Zerline as a solid kicker is, is going to be a big advantage for them. He doesn't one, miss big field goals close in. He just doesn't. One other thing to double down on Paul though, is we've talked numerous times about how depth creates your special team's ability. And if there's one thing that this Dallas Cowboys team is lacking, it's depth. Mm -hmm. They have depth at some skill positions, but I wonder how many rookies are going to be asked to be doing these coverages and if that could change their defensive of their coverages, their blocking ability, at least early on. It's, it, I, I, it might be something to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sorry, John. No, you're good, man. I, so, um, you know, I was being urged to get to the negative here, so um, I saved <laughs> the best for last because um, we're going to talk about Mike McCarthy a little bit. And you know, I think one thing we know as Washington fans is we've seen in the last year, and again, we talked last spot about seems like it's been three years or four years, not not one season, but we've seen the difference the right guy at the top can make, um, and that's the good news for us. That's also the bad news for Dallas, I believe, because I'm not a big Mike McCarthy fan, and I'm going to run through just – I'll try not to go on and on, but I'm going to run through some of his career stats – um, we know he's an offensive guy, right? He started out as an offensive coordinator with New Orleans. Um, all, but, all but one of his six years uh, in the league started out as offensive coordinator there. He's been a head coach for 14 years, all but last year with Green Bay. And guess what? His offenses were unbelievable, right? He, um, they were in the top half of the league in all but four seasons in Green Bay. Um, Did he have a quarterback? Why? Yeah, so and we might have a lot to do with two years of Brett Favre and then however many seasons of Aaron Rodgers. Um, they were not good rushing teams, though, in Green Bay. And that's something to keep an eye on because they only they were only in the top half of the league in rushing six times. So that's that's definitely not a, a strength or focus for McCarthy teams. Um, Name one a, Green Bay running back from the time Mike McCarthy was there. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Amon Green, wasn't he there? <laughs> oh, you're right, dude. That guy was a I stud. I guess throwing down in front of Mark. That was that guy was a stud. That's why I, I remember him. Yeah, the only reason you know him is because of fantasy football. Let's be real. I don't he play just, fantasy he's football. The one you know that. Cigarettes on the bench, man. I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but the so, point is, that's the only one I can think of, right? That's not like that's yeah, been a featured one. position on that team. Yeah, exactly. They don't, they, yeah. Um, defensively, even though, you know, we can debate like how much control does a head coach, I guess they have as much control over the defense as they want, depending on what their background was, but his defenses have not been great. Uh, only been in the top half of the league eight times in terms of, uh, in rushing only seven times and defending passing yards, um, only 11 times. So they're a little bit better, 
just like on offense, his offenses uh, pass better than they rush and his defenses defend the pass better than they defend the rush. So just not a lot of focus on, on the rushing attack. Um, as a head coach in Green Bay, he had a 600 record with Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. Went to the playoffs. This is impressive. Nine of 13 seasons, but only won uh, a little over 500% of those or, you know, uh, 50% of those uh, because 500% would be really good. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so he could get him there. And again, he probably had a lot of help under center to get him there. But once well, he, he also got played there, in a terrible division, that yeah. division was doo doo. Yeah. Well, for a long time. Sorry. So let's get to recent history. The last three seasons, mm -hmm. McCarthy's averaged 5.6 wins per season. Last season, his first in mm -hmm. Dallas, obviously, his offense ranked 14th in yards, gained 17th in points scored. Um, most of that came from the passing game. His defense was 23rd in yards and 28th in points allowed. So these are some of the lessons that I took from just a review of his career. Um, if McCarthy's offenses are going to be effective, it's going to be through the air, period, flat out. And that's what you saw that proven to you last year when Prescott went down. Um, they, even, even though they have a, I'm sorry, but a really great running back in Elliott sitting there, they didn't use him. So that tells you about McCarthy's mindset. Um, his teams have also struggled rushing the, the ball and defending the rush. Um, and he has shown himself to be a um, not a stellar postseason coach. In nine playoff seasons with Aaron Rodgers leading the way, he went out in the first round three times, out in the second round four more times, including in 2014 when the Packers were supposed to be the dominant walk, waltz into the Super Bowl team of that season. Um, they, they got knocked out. And then he did have the Super Bowl win. And I'm not minimizing that, but one Super Bowl win with, uh, you know, a decade plus of Aaron Rodgers on her center, that, that sucks. And that's why he's not in Green Bay anymore. Um, this is a really telling stat. When Aaron Rodgers was sidelined, um, their teams played terribly. And, and McCarthy has never beaten a team with a winning record with a backup quarterback in his entire career. He's never won a game with a backup um over yeah under center so that tells you again that if you, you know i'm not wishing dak prescott ill or or, or poor health uh because that would be classless <clears throat> but if it happens uh they're in big trouble because it's like, he, like he's not the kind of coach something can, something that's not debilitating a little turf toe or you know some, right. some quad tightness before our game that'd be okay so to just to wrap up the coaching overall i think at OC, I think Kellen Moore has a lot of potential. Um, very inexperienced, but he's been pretty impressive, at least starting out. Um, defensive coordinator Dan Quinn, we talked about, we don't know which Dan Quinn is the real Dan Quinn, the one that was in Seattle or the guy that was um, in everywhere Atlanta. else. <laughs> yes, and everywhere else. Yeah. And special teams, we think they're in pretty good shape. And I do, I do worry. Uh, I think Fossil is full of trickeration. Um, I've seen that, and I think that's something to keep an eye on this season. So that leaves the weak link. And unfortunately for Dallas, I think the weak link is Mike McCarthy. Um, Jerry Jones, he bet on McCarthy's success in Green Bay and all the perennial playoff appearances, that it wasn't just about Aaron Rodgers and before that Brett Favre. But given what we've seen, both with his defenses not being good, with them not rushing the ball effectively and relying totally on the quarterback and, and star wide receivers. I'm not a believer in Mike McCarthy. I think Mike McCarthy is the best thing to happen to Dallas and to Washington fans uh, since um, Jason Garrett. I don't know. <laughs> Dave Campo. <laughs> I actually think it's a big step down from Jason Garrett. I hate to say that because I know Garrett had his struggles, but I don't think McCarthy's the, even the coach that Garrett was. Bob, what do they think about, about Mr. McCarthy down in Dallas. Is he a Jerry guy because he, because Jerry can continue to push around the head coach? No, actually, you know, when he was hired, I, I remember the, you know, the, you know, the, the top sports guy in town um, being impressed with the hire. He was surprised that Jones hired McCarthy because the impression is that McCarthy is a, is a fairly strong coach. Uh, and, and the idea down here has always been that Jones wanted a Muppet, right? right? Somebody that, you know, somebody that said exactly what 
Jerry told him to say and say, and somebody whose mouth moved exactly when Jerry's hands moved, right? I mean, you get the imagery. Uh, it, it was, it was just, it, there was a lot of surprise and there was honestly a lot of, a lot of real hope. And there still is. People don't attribute last season to Mike McCarthy. They attribute last season to Dak Prescott getting injured. Well, the injuries in general. And I, as much as I would love to throw stones at it, how many times have we as Washington fans stood around and gone, well, if so-and-so hadn't gotten hurt, if this guy hadn't gotten hurt, if that guy had gotten to play a full season? I mean, I, guys, we've owned, a, we've owned a, a fan site now for, what, 12 years? And we've all said something to that effect at some point in time in those 12 years. Absolutely. You know, you know going all the way back to the, the, the late part of the 2000s when nearly every week somebody would post in the game thread, well, that touchdown wouldn't have happened if Sean Taylor were alive, you know, and, and let's face it. That's really what injuries are. They take a guy out of the lineup. It doesn't matter whether he's, whether he's injured or whether he's coming back next week or whether he's coming back next season, or whether he's never coming back. It, it's just everybody down here is, is semi-optimistic about this season, not because of the defense. We I mean, we pretty much shot the defense well and, you know, well and good. Um, but they're excited about the offense because Dak's coming back. They're excited about the offense because McCarthy's the head coach and he had great offenses in Green Bay all those years. And all they can see is a, a great quarterback and a great coach and all this wide receiver talent and a solid offensive line if everybody stays healthy and just steamrolling teams left, right, and center. So there's not a – McCarthy's not getting a rap at this point in time, not down here. Well, he already has a rap. I mean, to be honest with you, it, it's, I just think it's the nature of, it's the nature of any NFC East team to have hope with it when they're any good, any coaching turnover when you're sucking for year after year is c considered a promising new star. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying if they can keep the offense and all their star players healthy, that he won't score a gazillion points and, and they'll win some games. But I think what my only point is, is that he, I'll go back to what I said. One championship in 11 mm. years of Brett Favre, that's a, that's criminal. I mean, it really is. Um, it, no, you're, you're not wrong. I mean, you look at what Belichick did in the same amount of time with Tom Brady. And frankly, I'm not sure Brady's a better player than Aaron Rodgers. I'm not sure he's a better quarterback. He can't make all the same throws that Aaron Rodgers makes. He doesn't have the same physical gifts that Aaron Rodgers has. And you're absolutely right. You know, if Belichick had Rodgers, would anybody else have won a Super Bowl in that time frame? Uh, that's Belichick a pod. took Matt Castle to an 11 and five season. That's a yeah. good pod for another day though. I'd like, I'd like to break down the whole Tom Brady thing. Cause I, I well, think he's a different kind of cat. It's a whole different animal than Aaron Rodgers, but let's not go down that road right now. I'm, I'm with you, Mark. Let's no. do it. Uh, we can I do can... that. I will, I'll, I'll throw out there that with the Brady versus Belichick, how much of Brady's development is due to Belichick. And I'll I tell you later. Comment <laughs> or look. So I shared something on the board the other day. Actually, it might've been earlier today. Aggregate average rank uh, from football outsiders adjusted gains loss to injury. Yeah. Doing my rough quick look here, they rated that Dallas had 28. I don't know how they come up with that because they didn't lose that many, but some they were basically they had the top five most games lost due to injury this past season. So to Bob's point, I think it all hinges on health. And they're probably using the same excuse we've used for now 10 years, that if we were to have just been healthy, we would have competed. Well, we I'm didn't seeing... use it last year. We look at what we contended with last year, and we won the division. You know, I mean, we had as much uh, adversity as Dallas did last year. We had a coach with – Yeah, they said we, we – according to this, they had 28, we had 24. So we were right there in the same neighborhood as far as adjusted games lost. I, I, I think what I'm what I've heard of tonight, the 2021 Dallas Cowboys are a whole bunch of of ifs. Mm -hmm. If Dak Prescott is the Dak Prescott from the beginning of last year and he's healthy and can get it done, then they are going to score points 
if the offensive line can give him enough time to hold up and doesn't get him hurt again, the offense is probably going to be pretty competitive. If Dan Quinn can make hay out of all these new disparate parts and put it all together in time to win enough games to make a playoff run, they have a chance. If the back seven is strong enough and can make plays behind a, at best, iffy defensive line, I don't want to put them down completely, but that's not a strength of the team. Their defense is a huge if. The offense is a, can we give them a maybe or a probably even? Special teams, I mean, we know special teams are going to be awesome in Dallas. So special teams may be the only if they don't have. I think it's a team that has a chance to contend for playoffs if they stay healthy, if the defense starts to gel before it's too late. If Dak can stay health, can stay healthy, that's a lot of ifs in the NFL. So I, mm. I, if I was a Dallas fan, I think I'd be saying let's let's go, let's go seven and nine or eight and eight and show some progress on the defensive side, so that next year when Dak is truly healthy, we can make a run. Most Dallas fans don't think like that. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do the pundits. The no. pundits I'm going to the playoffs every year. So what I thought we would do is next time, um, good job, guys. Next time uh, we'll do uh, the Giants. We'll take on the, the dreaded G-men um, in, of New York, and um, and then we'll follow that up with Philadelphia. And probably what that's going to naturally lead to is a what's going to happen, what do we think is going to happen in the NFC East in 2021, kind of a wrap-up is where we can get into what we really want to talk about, which is how the Redskins are going to kick the ass of the rest of the NFC East. <laughs> All right. All right, gentlemen. Well done. Enjoyed it. Yes, sir. That was great. God's